Andy, um, you've been uh, long active in the uh, ITF. Can you tell us a little bit more? What is your background? What did you do? Uh, my background is started in networking when I went to San Francisco State and I uh, worked for a professor who was at that time at Pacific Bell and, and got me interested in networking. Then I got a job at David Systems in Sunnyvale working on networking and, and we were implementing bridging. And they needed somebody to implement the, the bridge MIB, which I'd never heard of a bridge MIB. And uh, in fact, it was before the very first one at RFC 1286. And I implemented the entire thing with the person who, who did the, actual, the spanning tree code. And that got me started in network management. When, when, when was that? I believe that was 1990. It was a, RFC 1286 was published in 91, so I think it was, it was before that, um, the internet drafts that led to that, that RFC. You, you already went to the IETFs at that time? Or? Uh, yes, I had started following in about 1988 and, you know, the budgets and things, I, I didn't get to go until um, Cambridge, I think, was the first meeting I actually got to, to attend, um, which was very fun. I was, Looked forward for, for a whole year to go, <laughs> and finally got to go and, and met uh, um, the chair of the Armon Working Group at the time. And uh, was we had started to, to put monitoring into our um, to our hubs. David Systems made um, managed uh, Ethernet hubs. It was one of the first companies that were putting counters and putting uh, management uh, instrumentation into into the networking devices. So I had been working on device drivers and, and operating systems, uh, things like that in the embedded systems. And uh, it, just, it just really changed the course of my career to work on that bridge mid because I spent the rest, the next 20 years working on uh, network management and um, embedded systems uh, so, management. So to that, uh, respect your career has not been planned. You just run into something and you liked it, and you're still doing it, basically. I think so. Uh, I I really thought SNMP was was a really great idea, and we um, invested uh, a lot in it. Um, after David Systems went to companies like Synoptics, uh, Bay, which became Bay Networks and then spent 10 years at Cisco Systems, and was one of the major contributors at Cisco Systems for, for SNMP infrastructure. Um, and it was really important to, to get common management within devices, because we had so many devices, um, it really gets to be impossible to, for the uh, applications to get the instrumentation um, in, a, in a completely ad hoc way. So without MIBs, uh, really had no hope of, of converging on, on common information that we could retrieve from the devices. So You said you started with bridge MIB and then you went to Armon. What exactly is Armon? It's remote monitoring, but can you yeah. explain a bit more? Okay, Armon was one of the first uh, MIB modules which uh, had configurable monitoring. And the reason we needed that was really the needle in the haystack problem. There was just too much data on these uh, um, hubs and, and, and ethernet devices to do adequate monitoring um, just from uh, delivering counters and, and that sort of uh, raw data to the application. So it was really the first embedded management application that we put into devices. So what I mean by configurable monitoring is it's just too expensive to collect everything with, uh, that you might need um, in remote monitoring. And, and those are the sort of things like uh, uh, who are the top talkers? So the MAC address is talking to other MAC addresses. Which ports are the most active? Which ones are having the most errors? So, so configurable reporting like that became very useful because you can't uh, collect everything at once. And, and it had some powerful features like um, uh, packet capture and filtering, for instance, that, that let you um, 
move, uh, which is traditionally management application logic into the device rather than just reporting um, complete statistics. What you see at this moment is that, uh, say, NetFlow IPFix is quite popular as, uh, say, monitoring protocol. Um, when would you use Armon? When would you use NetFlow IPFix? Do they serve different purposes? I think uh, IPFix is, is a natural evolution of Armon. Uh, it's probably a sufficient replacement for, for Armon. Uh, at, at this point. Armand did not have any notion of, of flows, uh, really, in the original Armand uh, uh, MIB modules. It, it was just address pairs and, and not application flows. So what IPFIX, not only did IPFIX um, provide a, an efficient push mechanism, which, which is very useful, but it had a notion of, of monitoring flows and, and associating traffic with, with applications. Uh, is, was really the, the essence of what Armon was getting at, but IPFIX is, is the, I guess, the evolutionary um, result of that. Oh, is a very, uh, I, I, so I think IPFIX replaces Armon in, in many ways. Are people still using Armon nowadays? Yes, some aspects of the uh, what we used to call the nine groups of Armon, uh, the original Armon MIB, uh, such as uh, events and and alarms, um, are used to this day in in, in most um, routers and and switches that still support that and still use that that concept. And also, um, Ethernet statistics and such are, are still used today. But I think the application analysis is, is moving to IPFIX is a better solution. Okay. Um, you have a lot of experience in implementing, say, Armon, BridgeMIP, but also NetConf, SNMP. Uh, if you look at um, your experience with SNMP and NetConf, uh, which one is easier to implement? Uh, are there specific things that make it hard or um, well, I was one of the original people pushing to have NetConf because SNMP is very strong for monitoring, but it was not as easy to implement for configuration. And the main reason for that is, is there really isn't any high-level operations in, in SNMP. It, it is a, a very low-level abstraction. So. Uh, for instance, in a CLI command, you can only do one CLI command at a time. And when you're typing a command, and, and you've, it, you're, you're giving parameters to that command, and you finish it, and then you go on to the next one. Um, SNMP has no such requirement. And, and that sort of thing made it difficult to implement configuration. SNMP was always very easy for monitoring, um, very straightforward, and, and I think it will still be a very viable monitoring solution for many years because it is very efficient in both protocol and implementation. But things like automicity of set operations, that kind of stuff made it very hard to implement SNMP and NetConf is easier in that respect? Yes, in some respects it is a lot easier because the, uh, the uh, arbitrary state that needs to be maintained for SNMP set is, is not required. Um, NetComp has some additional features like uh, some notion of transactions as a confirmed commit ca capability. Uh, the the commit operation in itself is an all or none uh, transaction. So, so this helps the NMS um, make changes to the box without maintaining a lot of backup state so, so that the, the device will be able to um, uh, roll back, for instance, uh, on its own without the NMS having to do it all manually. So it, it offloads some transaction capabilities to the device uh, that SNMP does not support. I, I think that transaction capability is a very important addition to NetConf compared to SNMP. Um, did people consider at the NetConf uh, 
development times to do also a, a distributed transaction. So you change all your routers to the new configuration or none of them. Was that considered or not? Uh, yes, that, that is supported as an optional capability in, in NetConf. It's optional to implement. And that, that is called a confirmed commit capability. It isn't as elegant as one might uh, think a, a network-wide transaction should be, but it gives the, the ability for the NMS to, to make a change on multiple devices and then have it either roll back or stick um, across the multiple devices in a, in a fairly easy way. Uh, I still think that work needs to evolve. There, there are situations where the uh, NMS um, should, should be able to do it in a more automated fashion rather than uh, tell each individual box uh, continue or go back. Um, there's no network-wide sort of uh, capabilities at, at that level. Would you like to see new work within the NetConf working group in this area, or do you think NetConf is stable enough, let's not change too much there and focus more on other aspects of NetConf? Uh, I think it could be done in a way that that is added as uh, additional capabilities. This, the way NetConf is designed is uh, that the, the server advertises its capabilities to, to the client and the client has to be aware of the schemas that go along with the capabilities to use them. Uh, so it can be done in a way that uh, new clients would know about this new feature and old clients w wouldn't try to use it because it's, it's a, an additional feature. So it can be done without a complete rewrite of the protocol. Um, and I would like to see it become mandatory and not optional in the future. Okay. And other new activity is, say, the Yang API. What exactly is that? Yang API is a HTTP REST protocol that is designed to leverage the, the same Yang modules within a NetConf server as the NetConf protocol uses. But the operations are not NetConf operations, they are HTTP operations like put and post, um, delete uh, and get. So, uh, the abstraction is of the device is done in a way that um, matches what REST developers ex expect a, um, a managed um, resource to, to look like and behave. And I think uh, the value is uh, that HTTP developers are comfortable with their own tools and, 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 and how REST works and they should be able to access a NetConf device to, to change its configuration or, or uh, you know, read any instrumentation, that sort of thing, um, without really knowing any NetConf, and that's what Yang API provides. The, the glue that holds it all together is that the, the data models are the same, the data naming is the same. I think that is the, the key issue that we really did not solve with uh, with uh, early attempts to, to homogenize uh, um, uh, network management, we were originally trying to get everybody to use the same protocol. And now I think we're realizing that that, that doesn't work. We are, we are realizing that, that protocols uh, are, are coupled to use cases and that if the the underlying data is, is the same, that you can easily use multiple protocols to manage the same device. So the key is the configuration data that you have described with Yang to make it accessible via this Yang API. Yes. Wouldn't the better name be, uh, say, RESTConf? Yes, how did you guess that we are changing the name to RESTConf? <laughs> uh, it has been pointed out that um, it, the relationship to NetConf would be more clear if, if it was the name was changed. Originally, we were concerned that we weren't a hundred percent restful, and that we would get we would get pushback because because we were relying on on schema. Um, 
the, the hybrid approach of Yang API is to not make the assumption that uh, like REST will make that the, the client doesn't know anything about what is available on the managed device. That, that really isn't the way CLI or SNMP ever worked. The, you cannot uh, put enough um, data model richness on the wire um, and, and still be efficient. So the, the data models um, need, need to be advertised somehow, and, and that is how uh, both protocols manage the same devices. They, they understand the, the same data models. However, um, in REST, you don't assume that, that you know what the structure is of a particular subtree, but in, in Yang API, it's okay to do that because we, the server says, here is the Yang module and it will map algorithmically to, to a resource tree. Um, the a REST client can still ignore the schema, but it will be much less efficient than, than if it understood where uh, certain data resides within, within the server and what to expect certain behaviors from, from operations that are supported as well. So we may expect uh, in the next few years a lot of activity within the ITF on REST conf. I hope so. As I, I think the the goal is is to uh, make the device as easily manageable as possible by the the different um, developers who who want to do that. It turns out that uh, not every uh, application is the same, and 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 some applications which could be considered more lightweight than others, really do not need all the complexity of NetConf. Um, but some do. So, so Yang API, which will be RESTConf, does not have all the stateful operations that NetConf does. It is, it is simpler. Um, so it is expected that um, they, uh, those operations will not n need things like the network-wide commit and, and complex uh, custom operations that, that NetConf provides. Um, so I think both protocols will have a place um, going forward. Okay, nice to hear. Thanks for the interview. Well, thank you.